Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is your pastor here, Pastor Michael Obo Onen, and it's such an honor and such a privilege to just lead over this Mavuno community. But I'm here to do a very simple task because I can't be with you right now, but I know that the person who is there is ready and equipped to bring God's word to you this morning. So this month we started an amazing new series, Love Island, and we're gonna be talking about relationships. For those of you that are in marriage, just being better equipped to handle our marriage and our conflicts, but even for you that's single, just being able to have the conversations that are going to ready you and make you better prepared even to have these conversations. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome to the stage our speaker for today, renowned speaker, leadership and life coach, our very own pastor, my friend, my brother, Pastor Wa. Um, it's good to be here. Thank you, Pastor Osai and Pastor Mike. It's been such an honor for me to be back. This is our sixth month we, uh, since we moved back to Kampala. Um, I was fine. I was living on the beach in Watamu. I don't know if you've been to Watamu. It's where God goes to play. Uh, and then Kampala calls. So, so we've been here six months uh, setting up a business, a coaching business, as Pastor Saya said. And it's... it's Kampala is interesting, but it's good, and I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad to join you. Uh, we're truly, truly privileged to hand over the leadership of Mavuno Kampala to Pastor Mike and Osan. They've done a great job. Come on, let's appreciate them. And uh, I'm really glad to see many of you. Uh, I'm constantly meeting people I married, people we walked with, uh, and uh, it's, it's good to hear some of those news. Uh, but most importantly, it's good for me to speak God's word to you this morning, um, isn't it? Amen. We're going to enjoy this. This is going to be great. This is going to be a great month, so please invite your friends and people to come. We're going to have a great conversation around relationships. I don't know why they invite me to speak about relationships, but I suspect it has something to do with what we are going to be talking about uh, this month. I want to welcome you who are visiting, if you're visiting for the first time. For those of you who are visiting... Uh, watching online. You're very, very welcome to this service. Uh, I wrote a book last year called A Dreamer's Dilemma. Um, if you haven't read it, read it. Uh, we have a few copies in the back. You can grab one, and if you're lucky, I'm going to sign it for you. All right. Brilliant. The reason when we start talking about relationships, we turn to God's Word, is because David said in the Psalms that the entrance of your Word brings light. Say that with me. The entrance of your light, word brings light. And what he really was trying to say is because the area of relationships is one that has a lot of confusion. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of emotion around relationships. A lot of people, in fact, experience a lot of difficulty. And part of it is because... of God's Word and obedience to that Word so you can begin to formulate your life and begin to walk and live accordance to that, in accordance to that Word. Hello. So let me ask you, have you ever been in love? How did you know? What made you realize that you were in love? 
Or talk to your neighbor if they're not your spouse. Since just turn to somebody and what made you know that you are in love? Did you just wake up one morning and think, wow, this thing is real? <laughs> what happened? For most people, possibly an event happened, right? Most of us who've been in love had a moment when it hit us that, you know what? I actually like this guy. I like him. Now, Ray, I don't know whether it was when the moment you asked whether she had a white dress, I don't know when it was. But I'm sure it's a moment it hit you that this is it. Let me tell you this story from this guy. This guy tells this story. He says his grandfather was sick. He says, my grandfather was sick. I was nearing the end of his life because he was fighting with lung cancer. I got a call from my aunt that I needed to come and visit home as his time was short. I had assumed that she was being dramatic as I had just seen him three weeks prior before he went into the hospital and he was doing fine. So I figured out I would take my new girlfriend and we would pay a visit to my grandparents and then head off to Miami for a couple of days. But I had no idea what I was walking into. We show up on a Friday evening and my grandfather who's been in the hospital is in pretty bad shape. He's lost about 25 kilos. I mean, I can't believe he was the same guy I had seen three weeks before. I had to excuse myself and just go out of the hospital and bawl my eyes out. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. My girlfriend came out to comfort me. And when I felt better, we walked in and visited all night at the hospital, staying. staying. The next morning, after we'd left, I was woken up by my aunt who called me and told me quietly that my grandfather had passed away and she needed my help. I quickly sprang into action and began helping with the arrangements. You know how it is. Calling family members and informing them. Calling a pastor, calling a funeral home, and trying to console my grandmother. All these things that go around it. At about noon or so, I realized that in the, in the kavuyo that was going on, I'm learning Luganda, y'all. I realized that I forgot about my girlfriend. Well, let me tell you where my girlfriend was all this time. She was in the kitchen, cleaning up, and, and after making lunch for everyone, she was setting up snacks for the family members that were on their way. She even was baking something in the oven. This woman, who was expecting to spend some time on a beach with her boyfriend, and instead had been stuck, slapped with an awkward situation of a family death and confusion around it, was here doing well. This was the first time she was meeting any of my family, and now she was surrounded by everyone during a death in the family. Not only was she being great, she never once mentioned about leaving or any of our feelings or any inconvenience that had been caused by these things. At that moment, her being there just to help in any way she could, it warmed my heart. And I knew this was the woman I wanted to be with for the rest of my life. My grandmother later, sitting was there later in the day, was sitting there thanking my girlfriend for all she did. And then she said, I noticed how you handle today. That's enough in my book. You have my permission to marry my grandson. And little did I know that a year later, with her approval, I made that woman my wife. <laughs> Come on, somebody. We all have a moment when we realize, yes, this is the person I want to marry, or I want to spend the rest of my life with. There's nothing like romantic love. Nothing. Nothing. It starts great. It's brilliant. Scientists are telling us it takes about two years of a high. And it's, you know, people who are in love are literally high. They're literally on some drug. The amount of hormones and chemicals your brain is producing I mean, you see this person and you feel tingly all over. You have a, a, a warm, fuzzy feeling. You just, the phone rings and it's like, oh my gosh. You know, it's like umeme just, you got plugged into the umeme. 
network. I mean, it's just amazing. You see them, you feel things, you, talk, you, can, talk, you can talk all night on the phone. You hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. You know, and it's just never ending. Beautiful. And it goes great and it goes brilliant. We love them. We dream. We're just, oh my gosh. There's nothing like romantic love. And it goes beautifully until it's no longer going beautifully. It's about two years. The hormones just, you get onto the edge and your body can't tolerate them anymore. And it shuts them off. And you go off the cliff. And now all of a sudden, this person that you used to think were nice and cool, they're no longer as nice and cool. Those little things that used to annoy you, now really aggravating you and getting on your nerves. Now you used to, you used to, you used to love how they laugh. You can't stand how they laugh. You're wondering, why do you sneeze like that? Close your mouth when you're eating. What's wrong with you? Why are you always complaining? Why do you look like this? And all of a sudden, you moved from paradise to hell. So the question is, how does this happen? And this is something that baffles a lot of people. And it hurts a lot of people, especially when they're in relationships. Because the question we ask ourselves is, how do we find a relationship that lasts? Something that I can live in and just be happy for a moment. Can I just be happy? Can I just have a relationship that works? I'm glad you asked me that question. Because that's what we're going to be talking about this month. So I want you to call your friends and loved ones and bring them next Sunday. And this is what we're going to talk about. This series is for you if you're single, because you need all the help you can get. This series is for you if you're dating, because we know you're high in love and you need some wisdom. This series is for you if you're engaged, so that you can have certain conversations before you make a big commitment. This series is for you if you're married, because some of you are going through the grinder of, <laughs> of marriage. This series is for you if you're divorced and wondering what's going to happen to me. This series is for you if you're camped at Heartbreak Motel and you hate life and you hate men and you hate women and you want nothing to do with them. This series is for you! Now, what happens when it comes to love and marriage? Why is this important? Now, let me say this. One of the most emotional series that we teach I have taught, even in this church, in the years gone by, has centered around relationships because there's a lot of pain around this. Now, remember, if we do not do things God's way, we have no right to expect God's results. Therefore, repentance is receiving that understanding and then saying, okay, I need to make some changes. Now, this is going to be a difficult message. We're going to try and laugh around it. And we're going to enjoy it. So please engage me and speak with me. And let's teach it together and let's learn together. And when it hurts, you say amen. amen. Now, when it comes to relationships and marriage, all of us have a box of dreams. Each one of you listening to me and those of you watching to me by television, you have a box of dreams. This box contains all those things that you hope that the relationship will bring you. These are your hopes. These are your dreams. These are your desires. These are the things that you want to get from the relationship. And sometimes those things are not completely clear. However, the more you continue to be in relationship with this person, the more it becomes clear to you that, you know what? You have a box of dreams. You have a box of dreams and desires. Now, let's talk about it. These dreams are the things that we want from a person. So let me ask you, what do women want in a relationship? What do women want? We asked this question. Let's see if we got the correct answer. Women want children in a relationship. Beautiful children at that. Instagram-worthy children. So that you can post pictures and say, look what the Lord and my spouse have done. <laughs> Beautiful children. Lovely children. Happy family. How many kids? Two or three? Four or five? However, however many women want children. 
What do women want in relationships? Women want ample provision. The key word here is ample. Enough money to pay the bills, feed the family, and to do a few other things. Nobody wants the struggle life. Brothers, you're being awfully quiet this morning. <laughs> what do women want in marriage and relationships? They want a grand lifestyle. Give me a beautiful home. Build me a nice house. I want this to look good. I want us to have a great life. I want us to be able to travel. I want us to go to Dubai and to go to Milan and to go to Cayman Islands. You just cannot be taking me to Barara every time. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with Mbarara, but I'm just saying, Mbarara is the beginning point. <laughs> you know, if you take her to Mbarara twice, the next time you propose to go to Mbarara, she will have a busy engagement. She'll be like, ah, you know, I'm too busy at work. Come on, women. I'm preaching better than you're shouting. Women, what do women want? They want enough money. There has to be money. Brothers, listen to me. If you don't have money, work harder. <laughs> women want money. You must have money. This is why acceleration and ease must be your portion. What do women want in their box of dreams? Women want a beautiful home. They want a home, a place where they can rest, and they can set up their, decorate it and make it look just like they've always dreamt and wanted. What do women want in relationship? They want absolute fidelity. Absolute fidelity. They want to be the one, the only, and then no, nobody else but them. What do women want in relationships? Women want the picture-perfect lifestyle. And all the sisters in the house said... Thank you. Now, what do men want in a relationship? Since sisters cannot get into a relationship by themselves. Let's talk about it because men are quiet these days. They don't want to say what they want since they are afraid that they might get in trouble. Well, men, are you in the house this afternoon? Can I speak for you? All right. You better reflect your yes in the offering basket. What do men want in relationships? Men want endless sex. Please. The key word there is endless. Amen. Is there a rating on this series? <laughs> they do. They do. Whether they are saved or not, whether they, whether they come from Africa or Asia, they are all the same. They want endless sex. What do men want in relationship? They want utmost respect. Utmost respect. Say that with me. Now, respect to a man is what water is to a fish. He cannot live and thrive without it. In fact, you'd rather respect a man than love him. You'd, better, you'd, you'd rather respect a man than love him. Why? Because respect is the foundation of masculinity. Men want to be respected. Now, let me explain this to you, women, because women understand respect differently from how men understand it. Women think, I will give you respect if you behave yourself correctly. I will give you respect if you're worthy of respect. I will give you respect if you prove that you qualify for the respect. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way with men. Women, men just need respect because they are men. Now, of course, this is offensive. This is why I told you in the beginning this is going to be hard. But you see, the word of God has to break us first before it changes us. <laughs> Scripture commands it. It says, it says, wives, you must respect your husbands. Men just do well when they're respected. They thrive. 
The egos are so delicate. All you need to tell them is to just tell them, you can do it. You're the man. Yes. And they'll be fine. You just do that and give him a sandwich, he'll go and conquer the world. What do men want in relationship? They want superior support to achieve their dreams. Superior support. They want people who are on their corner, who are cheering them on. Not just critiquing and criticizing them. They want superior support. Support means that I'm with you, I'm behind you, I'm going to walk with you, you're going to succeed, and at the end of the day, you're going to find me here. I am the one person who will always be on your team. What do men want in relationships? Men want a happy wife and happy kids. Just a happy wife. Many women do not understand how healing it is for a man to see a happy wife. It's healing. Because it means, and it says to him, you've done well. Even though we are aware of our shortcomings and our failures. When I get past away, you're preaching this thing very well. And finally, what do men want in relationships? Men want success. They want success. They want a sense of success. So, how do we come about our box of dreams? How did you arrive to your box of dreams? How did this happen? There's two ways that this happens. The first one is what we saw growing up. So, all of us grew up. And when we were growing up, these things we saw at home, these things we saw around us that informs our box of dreams. If we grew up in a home where there was a lot of peace and there was a lot of joy and happiness, that becomes something that we value when we get into relationship. If we grew up in a relationship where respect was a big thing, then we, grew, then we automatically, that becomes something that we want in our box of expectations. What, 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 what? If we grew up and maybe there was a bit of strife in the home and there was violence and we didn't like that, then peace becomes a major object in our, in our box of dreams because we're like, you know what, I don't like what I saw, I need something else. And what we grew up seeing informs what we want in our box of dreams. It informs us. If we saw education... If we saw a pursuit of education or a pursuit of excellence, if, I, if, my, if, I, if my family were very strict and they wanted things done a particular way, that becomes a, a part of me. It's something that I want. And it, it joins, uh, becomes a part of what is my box of dreams. The second way we come about our box of dreams is what we see around us. Our friends, our neighbors, our church community, how we see people relating, how, how when we are learning and seeing uh, f families being set up, relationships, how relationships are being run, it informs us how a husband and a wife should treat each other. Some of us, unfortunately, were not taught. We just grew up sort of in the jungle. We were not taught how to run a family and to lead it. And until we get into church, we begin to understand how a husband is supposed to treat a wife, how a wife is supposed to treat a husband, how a parent, how a father is supposed to lead a home and lead his children. We have no idea. Idea. But when we begin to be exposed to these things, we assimilate those things. And whether we get them at church, at the bar, in the neighborhood, at school, or on the internet, it makes no difference. Those things become part of our box of dreams. Now, it's important to understand that your box of dream is yours, and your box of dreams is valid. This is one of the big challenges that people get into relationship with because we come with these things that we hope for and expect and for some reason if you've gotten into a relationship with somebody who's mistreated you or handled you badly or abandoned you because of your box of dreams we tend to be shamed or to feel like we're being shamed for having dreams and I'm here to say it's okay to have your box of dreams it's perfectly okay for you to want that red Ferrari it's okay your dreams are valid. Your desires are valid. They're not criminal. They have a base. They have a place. They have a story where you're coming from. And you need to honor that and say, yes, this is in my box of dreams. Now, here is the problem. Let's talk about it. At some point in your relationship, however, is this being our box of dreams, we get into a relationship with someone and then we hand over the box of dreams to the person that we love. Come here, Evie. This is my wife, Evie. So we call them up and we say, this is my box of dreams and 
desires, and I give it to her, and I say, yo, you better make it happen for me. And there lies the problem. Thank you. So, no, no, no. Go with it. Go sit with it. Go sit with it over there. I need you to understand my dreams. <laughs> now, this is the problem that happens. Is we hand over our dreams, our box of dreams to our partner, and then we look at them and we say, make it happen for me. Meanwhile, that box of dreams have dreams that are rational, that are practical, that make sense, that I can identify, that I crafted, that I own, that belong to me, that are dear and near and sensitive to me. If you ask me any time of night or day what's in my dream, box of dreams, I'll tell you. I'll tell you, and I'll tell you with emotion because I feel something about those things. However, the person I've handed over my box of dreams has no clue that's how I feel about those dreams. In fact, they may feel nothing about those dreams and my hopes and my desires. And the problem happens, the collision happens when we hand over our box of dreams to someone else and say, now you fulfill my dreams. Do you love me? Show it. Prove it. And how do you prove it? By helping me achieve my dreams. Meanwhile, we forget that's the most irrational and unrealistic expectation ever you can have of a partner. So my box of dreams suddenly becomes my partner's box of what? Expectations. To me, they're dreams, but to them, they're expectations, they're demands. There are roles. It's work. It's, it's something I don't feel for. It's something I really am not as excited about as you are. And the collision happens, and then we have problems. Because I realize, oh, so you mean to tell me, eh? you don't love me anymore. So you mean to tell me my dreams don't matter. They don't matter to you anymore. You're just thinking of yourself right now. So you hit a deadlock. Relationships do not last long in a deadlock. A decision has to be made. Most people will make one or four decisions. The first one is exit the relationship. They check out. They terminate the relationship. You're dumped or you dump. Whatever it is, pick your pick. You end the relationship. It's over. Bye. See you later. Relationship finished. And there you are, camped at Heartbreak Motel, which unfortunately some of you might be at currently. Hello? The second decision to break the deadlock is I sit these people down that I'm in a relationship and I bend them, especially the strong-willed ones. You bend them and you win. Therefore, making them possess your box of expectations. This is where you have in relationships someone who's following someone, but inside they hate it and they're resentful. They're going along, they're happy and smiling, but inside they have murderous thoughts inside. They're sharpening knives, throwing arrows, cooking poison, throwing witchcraft. You guys are looking at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. But you know exactly what I'm talking about. We agree. We force them to agree. So we win and have our way. The third way, the third way out of this situation is to conform and let them win. We're like, you know what? It's not worth the fight. I'm not going to hustle about it. It's cool. We're going to do what you want. You conform and let them win. You pack your dreams. Forget about them. There's men here who are listening to me. They say, if you only knew my dreams. If this woman I'm, I'm seated next to knew half of my dreams, knew half of my dreams. <laughs> Come on, Pastor, well, you're preaching good. 
The fourth way out of this compromise is to compromise. Out of this situation is to compromise. And this is where most marriages are at, where we simply compromise. It's a give and take. You win some, it's okay. We're going to make this thing work. After all, we have kids. Eh, let's limp through this thing. Now, the problem with this is that when you end up at this point of compromise, your relationship moves from a love relationship into a data collector relationship. Everybody say data collector. Now, a data collector relationship is where one, I do things for you so that you can do things for me. Or I will do something for you if you will do something for me. If you do, I do. If you don't, I don't. And life moves on. Now, when relationships hit this spot, the first casualty is gratitude. Thankfulness. Because the foundation of any healthy relationship is gratitude. I am glad I met you. I am glad you're in my life. I am happy that you and I are together. The moment with these expectations collide, gratitude flies out of the window. And so the adult question to ask in this conversation, for anyone that's been listening to me so far, is this, right? What should I do with my box? That's the question of the day. If we can answer that question, we can go home and eat chicken since we finished fasting. What do I do with my box? Now, this is from people who've been married for a long time and have had healthy relationships and have had healthy marriages. Please pay attention. Please listen carefully. For any relationship to remain healthy, you and I must answer this question correctly. And the question is, what does your spouse owe you? What does your partner owe you? And the beautiful, complicated answer of all the universe is nothing. They owe you absolutely nothing. In fact, the people who go to divorce court find that out. The moment the relationship and you really think about it. You just sign a piece of paper and all sense of obligation for each other is gone just like that. Gone. They owe you nothing. The truth is nobody has ever owed you anything from the start. If you can answer, if you and I can answer this question correctly, our relationship life will be healthy. Now, because whatever is given in marriage or in relationships must be done freely and without expectation of return. Must be done freely and without expectation of return. The foundation of this understanding is in the scripture. There's two scriptures, there's two people who tell us about this. The first one is our Lord Jesus Christ, in the book of Luke, chapter 13 and verse 34. And the Apostle Paul, from the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Luke, chapter 13 and verse 34. Let's go to Ephesians. Skip over to Ephesians. We're going to read the, the book in, in Ephesians. And I'm going to read Ephesians from a translation known as the Message Bible. If you have, it, if you have the, the, the app, please go skip over to the scripture in Ephesians. We're going to read that one. Ephesians. Chapter 5, from verse 1 and 2. Now, Ephesians, that's not Ephesians. I want Ephesians. Now, that's a good scripture also, but I want Ephesians. Do you have it? If you have it in your Bible, there you go. Let's read it together. Look, let's look it up. It's up here on our screen. Let's read it together. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. Verse 2. And walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Listen to what the scripture says, this particular scripture says in the, in the, in the message translation. Listen to this. Watch what God does, then you do it. Like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. Mostly what God does is love you. Keep company with him 
and learn a life of love, observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give us everything of himself to us. Love like that. What is Paul saying? He's saying the love with which you love the person you get into a relationship with must be a pure kind of love, must be the kind of love that says, I have my box of dreams, but I am not coming to you to make you fulfill my box of dreams. I am coming to you to give of myself to you and say, how can I help you meet your box of dreams? Now, how can I help you meet your box of dreams? You see, Jesus, Scripture says in the book of Philippians, who was God, in, the, in his very nature was God, did not see being equal with God as something to be reached out for, but humbled himself to death, even death on a cross. And therefore has God highly exalted him and given him a name that's above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is God. What Jesus did was that he left the riches of glory. He overlooked our sin. He overlooked our disobedience. He overlooked our difficulty. He overlooked our hardness of heart. And he said, I'm going to love you and I'm going to pursue you and I'm going to be kind to you. Paul says in the Corinthians, he says, it's the kindness it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. It is His kindness, His mercy, His favor. While we were yet sinners, the Christ died for us. And that's the kind of love that He says here. He says that's the God kind of love. That's the kind of love that sustains relationship. That's the kind of love that makes relationships last. Because it's not a relationship where we're going in and saying, you owe me something or I owe you something. It's one that goes and says, I love you. I am grateful for you. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to do everything in my power to give to you and help you achieve your dreams. Now, now, the real reason we struggle with that message is because if we are going to follow it, then it means we cannot be casual with our relationships. This is why people struggle with this, because it means we're not going into a relationship with our own agenda. And that's hard. And sometimes we're lonely, and we want to get over this fight. We need someone. But if you cannot love someone this way, if we cannot learn to love this way, then we have no right to walk and expect our relationships to thrive and to do well. And so the question I want to ask you this, this afternoon as we finish this message is this. Who has your box of expectation? Who? And secondly, what's in your box? Because you have a box. What's in it? And there's some of us who've never quite interrogated what's in our box. Especially if you're single. You need to know what's in your box. There's people who are married here who've hid their boxes. And maybe the real cause of heartache, maybe the real reason you have pain is because you packed your box of hopes and dreams and you gave up everything and you constantly think you are owed something by your spouse. And you may not be verbally angry, you may not be visibly angry, but you are angry. In fact, for some of you, maybe this message is making you angry. Which is good. Please remember this. The worst emotion to leave church with is happy. Because if you leave 
church when you're happy, you have no impetus to institute the necessary changes to change your life. It's okay to leave church and go and cry in your car. Go up, get upset at the pastor, not even greet anyone. you come in. It's called my hopes and my dreams. Please pick it as you come to the living room to meet me. And nobody wants to pick it because to them, it's expectations, it's roles, it's duty. It destroys the essence of love. Paul says, learn to love like Christ loved. If we can learn that, then we will know and have relationships that last. at their boxes and shaking their heads. Lord, looking into those boxes might bring disappointment, pain, and maybe for some joy, but for many, it's an illusion. I pray in Jesus' name that you would open our eyes to see 
that you honor the desires that we have. You said in your word that you give us the desires of our hearts. I pray that you give us the fortitude, spiritual courage to look into our boxes. And Lord, I know as we, as others, as we sit in your presence, there's others of us who would say, I don't even have my box. I know it. I've given it to someone else. I've given it to my spouse. And because of it, I'm disappointed. I'm angry. I'm disillusioned about relationships. I've given up on any hope or any chance of happiness, longing and fulfillment. And Lord, the reason is because we've given away that box. I pray in Jesus' name that we would gain the courage again to pick that box and say, this is my box. These are my hopes. These are my dreams. And it's okay. Holy Spirit, would you begin to illuminate right now? I pray in Jesus' name for people who are struggling all over across this service and watching by television, struggling in their relationships, struggling with how they view marriage, family. Father, let your presence right now, wherever you are, let God begin to heal you. Let God begin to touch you. Father, I pray that there will be a restoration and a renewal. Spirit of God, we welcome you. We welcome you to speak. We welcome you to touch us. We welcome you to minister to us. Lord, I pray that we would look at what's inside of our boxes and we would pick up our boxes because they're ours. In your name we pray. Amen. Come on, come on. Come on, put your hands together one more time. If you don't mind, rise up on your feet in honor. Has this been good? You guys, instruction has been given and it should be re received. Rise up on your feet. As we honor the man of God who has brought the word. If you think it is easy, I will give you the microphone one of these days that you see how we sweat when we get here and he has spoken truth today yes has it been a happy conversation <laughs> okay turn to your neighbor and just tell them two things that you have gotten today two let's have a brief chat if you are standing with your spouse i wish you all the best Buanaham. Yes. Uh -huh. Wow. If you need handkerchief, tissue, we have them in uh, abundance. Amen. Amen. Mine was, my box is valid, but I should be ready to release that box. <laughs> For the other, I should be ready to let go of my needs and wants and help the other person. My person. Don't tell him I said, yes, we are learning together. <laughs> hey, no, we pray. <laughs> One more time, put your hands together for Pastor Wa. Great conversation. Now look around you, look around you. Do you see empty chairs? Look, look, look. Can you see empty chairs? Huh? Okay, it's your responsibility next Sunday to fill them up. Amen. Don't just come to eat the word, to receive Bring someone else. Eh? Many marriages are suffering. People don't believe in relationships anymore. People can do bad all by themselves these days. Bring somebody. Let them find healing. Amen. Remember what he said. If you are headed or you are already at Heartbreak Hotel, this someone is for you. 
If you are if you are married, this someone is for you. If you are single, this someone is for you. If you don't even want any of the three, this someone is still for you. So bring somebody, okay? Okay. Why don't you just lift up your hands in worship and say, Lord, thank you for the word today. Thank you for what you have told me today. Come on, come on. Just say, thank you, Lord. May I be a practitioner of the word and not just somebody who hears alone. Ask him to direct you to that one person who needs to hear this message this week. Ask him to direct you to that person. Our dear Lord, we thank you for that which you have spoken to us today. We receive it. We receive it in humility. We ask, O oh God, that you help us be practitioners of the word. Help us, O oh God, to also use it as a conversation starter in our workplaces, in our businesses, in our homes, and just bring about relief and release in the community around us. Lord, we pray for Pastor Juan and his family. Even as he has given of himself, Lord God, in bringing your word today, we pray a hedge of defense around him. We pray that you will watch over him, oh God. There will not be any backlash in his marriage, in his relationship with Pastor Evie. We pray a protection over that relationship right now in the name of Jesus. We speak peace. We speak the joy of the Lord. We speak the love of the Almighty God to overwhelm the both of them. And we also pray a covering over their children, Alex and Aiden. Be with them all this week, Abba Father, in their going out and in their coming in. And Lord God, I speak a blessing over your people, that as they go home today, that they will have conversations in their cars, they will have conversations uh, on their border borders, every, anything that they are using as their means of transport. That Lord, this word will continue to marinate in their hearts, oh God. And Father in heaven, it will bring about transformation, oh God, and salvation. We pray, Almighty King, that you will use us this week to be fearless, Abba Father. And King of Glory, use this message, Abba Father, to bring many into your kingdom this week. We thank you, Almighty God, for that one person you are going to direct us to this week, Abba Father, to speak this same word to that person, O oh God, and they will receive salvation. And we'll be able to bring them to our discipleship groups or even bring them to church on Sunday. And we'll all be here together to give glory and honor to your holy name. We thank you, Almighty King. We pray, Lord Jesus, once again for our children going back to school this week. They are blessed and highly favored of the Lord. Thank you, O oh God, for our businesses and our jobs. He's blessed, Lord God. This week, we shall walk in acceleration and ease in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Abba Father. For in Jesus' name we have prayed. And all God's people shout a big amen. Now turn to your neighbor and say, may the grace and the fellowship be with us all. Amen. See you all tomorrow morning for 4.30 a.m. prayers. Come and pray. Amen. God bless you.